Most gracious God, our eternal Father, as we come today in the name of your Savior, our Savior, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who extended that amazing grace to us. Your word says that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we thank you, Lord, for grace. When we were out there doing whatever we wanted to do, had no idea, wasn't caring about you, weren't thinking about you, but you saw fit to seek us out, to send someone into our lives to tell us about the gospel, the good news, and about this amazing grace that you offered us. And so we thank you today. We sit here today regenerated transform and you're still working on us to conform us into the image of your son and we thank you today and we come today we ask forgiveness of our sins of the times when we have fallen short we have not done those things have been pleasing in your sight said the wrong thing thought the wrong thing did the wrong thing but we thank you lord but first John 1 9 it says, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as we come together today, we ask and we thank you for your many, many blessings. We hear the good news of Brother Tyrone as he's about to transition back home. Good news about Rosa coming through surgery. And again, we, we go back to DeMar Hamlin and we see all, well, we know the power of prayer. That is our weapon. That's our access to you. And so we thank you, Lord, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace that we might find grace to help in our time of need. We are so thankful that we can cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. We thank you so much that you're the great provider because you said a cattle on a thousand hills belongs to you. And we know as we look back, all the things that you've blessed us with. So we come today just to say thank you. Thank you. And we just commit this time to you. I pray Lord that all that I say and do will be pleasing in your sight. And that as we study again, this lesson today, it's about duty about what you have called us to do and what we should be doing after you've saved us. So we just thank you again for this opportunity to come together, to share praise reports, testimonies, and to exhort and encourage one another as we go forward. Again, we thank you for our pastor, Pastor Cockrell. As Camille just said, uh, we are so blessed. We were just talking earlier. We are so blessed to have a pastor who is so, uh, I like that word cleave, how he cleaves to you. And so we thank you for him and his, and his teaching and his sermons and all that we have. But we ask, and so bless this time that we have in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Woo, mm. all right, okay. Um, before we get into the lesson today, I just want to share a couple of things. We were talking about duty and rights, but it, there's a couple of things I want to want to share with you very quickly. Uh, 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 Camille brought this to me. It's a picture in the Sun paper today. And uh, sometimes Camille asks me, well, why do you get that paper? And I say, well, I want to find out what the enemy's doing and what they're writing about. And so... Um, uh, she bought me this uh, paper today about the, the new our new governor and his pastor, and she looked him up. And uh, the uh, theme, or I guess the uh, focal point of his preaching is climate change. Uh, uh, excuse me, Camille said, I didn't say anything about the gospel or about getting people saved, but it's about saving the planet. And so... I'll put that aside, okay? So now we know where it's coming from. But then also, this was from um, Sunday's paper. And there's a picture there on the front. 
Okay, that's a, uh, and I'll read the caption underneath. And it says, wait a minute, let me get my cheetahs here. All right, here we go. House of Delegate Speaker Adrian A. Jones, a Baltimore County Democrat, sponsored a bill last year to put a state constitutional right to abortion on the ballot. The House passed the legislation, but State Senator President Bill Ferguson above didn't bring it up for vote. Jones plans to bring the measure up again this session. And so as we see, they never stop. Okay. <laughs> they never stop. They don't go away. They just keep coming back. They're going to push that agenda. Okay. But uh, as I told Camille, if I see one more Save the Dog commercial playing Silent Night, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pet lover, okay? Um, I had a couple dogs, and uh, then I decided I couldn't get up and walk people or a dog six in the morning. And uh, I changed enough diapers that I wasn't gonna do to pick up stuff, so I went to Tropical Fish. But anyway, that's another story. But anyway, we see that uh, as Christians, what, what we're up against, what's out there and, and what the agenda of what uh, folk are trying to, uh, trying to push. And so, but today's lesson, I think is, is gonna challenge us in a lot of different ways. I know it challenged me and had me thinking about some, about, uh, you know, what am I doing? Okay, and, and, the, and the title is, uh, civil stewardship, which is duty versus rights. And I'm going to read the introduction and then we're going to get into the video and then come back and I got some scriptures and we're going to be looking at the Bible with, from the biblical standpoint about duty. Uh, and, and many of us have heard about the 80-20, right? 80-20 rule. 80% of the work in the church is done by 20% of the people or vice versa. Okay, but anyway, we're going to look at it. What does the Bible say? What, what does the Bible require of us? And it says duty is not a popular concept in our society today, for it requires not only hard work, but also a patient perseverance, regardless of the outcome. Yet duty was a guiding star for our founding fathers. They understood that it was a biblical trait and also believed that every right enshrined in the declaration and the constitution had a corresponding citizen duty that accompanied it. They knew it was impossible to preserve freedom without an associated sense of duty. Today, as more and more Americans want freedom apart from moral restraint, and absent of any sense of individual responsibility or personal inconvenience, it is more important than ever that we rediscover the importance of duty and the biblical foundation that it produces. In this session, we will learn the Bible base for duty, what happens to individuals and societies when duty is neglected, the key difference between the French and American revolutions, we'll talk about that, and why duty has become a neglected character trait today. Okay, and so without any further, Paula, you can cue the video, we'll hit that, and then we'll come back and we'll go to the scriptures uh, and, and some- Every American citizen has been endowed with a set of rights. Our founding fathers said that with every right, there is a corresponding duty. What would they think about a society that emphasizes rights, but remains silent about citizen duties? What is the duty of a free citizen? Join historian David Martin as he traces America's history back to the source in building on the American heritage. Uncover the forgotten stories, examine the nation's founding documents, and discover firsthand our founding fathers' original intent. 
explore the morals and values America was built on centuries ago. Learn the truth of America's past so you can shape America's future. This is building on the American heritage. David, we all love our freedom. We love enjoying the blessings of liberty. But with those blessings, there also comes a burden or a responsibility to do something about it. Kind of a, uh, oh, a play in your role to make sure that that freedom is not only yeah. something I enjoy, but you get to enjoy it and our, our next generation gets to enjoy it as our well. Our founding fathers who gave us these rights, or at least secured them to us, they were rights given by God, the right. founding fathers secured them. They said to every right, there's a commensurate duty. So if we have a right to free speech, which we do, we also have the duty to be honest in what we say and be truthful and be accurate. And we got a right to free speech, but there's a duty that goes with it. We enjoy liberty. We got a duty to be involved in government, to choose the right kind of leaders, to find out the right things about leaders when we go to vote so we can cast an informed vote. So if you have the freedom to vote, if you have the freedom to choose your leaders, that means you, you got, got a duty to go be to investigate. In the way you that's know it. exactly yeah. right. So with, with every single right that's out there, there's a duty. And if you don't take the duty side of it, you cannot preserve the rights. It will deteriorate into really anarchy. And, and what happens is it becomes a licentious kind of a thing. Yeah. I have the right to do whatever I want. No, you don't. Uh, there's a great passage in the Bible where twice we're told that we have the law of liberty. Those two things seem awesome. Liberty, that's freedom from law, isn't it? No, it is law that provides you liberty. When you have the standards and the rule of law, you have freedom in, in so many ways. And it's the same way with duty and rights. We have rights. Those rights are given us by God. And that's really what made America different from other places. And that's why we had so much more self-government, because we governed ourselves. If we, we have a right to be a self-governing nation, we have a duty to be self-governing citizens. So, so in other words, it's not then just a, like you said, licentiousness. It's not just a freedom to do whatever feels good, sort of this libertarian view that says, just get government out of my life. I can make all my yeah. own decisions and do whatever feels good to me. There are parameters. There's, there's boundaries there. Absolutely. And, and we're told in the Bible about government. Government's instituted and created by God. We're told in 1 Timothy that God has given laws and is to regulate the bad guys. And by the way, a lot of the laws that help a society are moral laws. That's why in the common law, which we've had for hundreds of years, the common law lists all these moral behaviors. I mean, if you take the, the logic that if it's done in private, just between me and whoever, if it's consenting kind of stuff, then it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Really? Well, I think embezzlement can be done in private. Right. I, I, there, there's no crime that is limited just to you individually. It affects everyone else. Yeah. So the libertarian viewpoint, now there's some, some basis for saying a libertarian view of government is that government should be limited. Sure. But sure. you can't exist without government. So you, you have government, you have a right to have government, but you have a duty to have a restrained, limited government, not a tyrannical government, not an overbearing government. So every right still has a, a duty that goes with it. And those two things cannot be separated. And, and when you separate them, you turn from freedom to anarchy, whether it's individual anarchy or anything else. And, and that's really what we've seen the rise of in America. We now have all these anarchist groups that show up to protest when, whenever there's economic conferences or whatever. We, we've seen the rise of things that we haven't seen in America in a long time. And part of that is we've abandoned the moral standard. We have a duty to, to uphold what God has told us we're to do, whether it's the Ten Commandments or anything else. But when we abandon that standard, we really force ourselves to have more government. I love the way that Robert Winthrop described this back in the 1840s. And Robert Winthrop was the Speaker of the House. He's actually a great historian. He's the founder of the Massachusetts Historical Society. He's the guy that gave the speech when they laid the cornerstone at the Washington Monument. And he talked about how that every society must be governed in some way or the other. And he talked about you can be governed either by the Bible or by the band. Events are back, you guys. Events are back. They're booking speakers like you. They're paying them $5,000. Bayonet. You can force people to do what's right, or you can choose to do what's right. If you cannot regulate yourself, the government will regulate you. So if you want liberty, you have to be restrained. Is that why the, the difference really between how the French went with the French yeah. Revolution and the Americans with the American Revolution? Because they really did do the kind of total libertarian yeah. idea of everybody just do whatever feels good. That's really where they went. Where with us, there was a biblical foundation yeah. that said, yes, you have freedom, but it's not to do anything you want. You've got to govern yourself, as you said. Well, you take a French values. example where, where the French did have a very licentious view. And theirs was a secular view of liberty as well. 
uh, you look at their motto, it doesn't involve God, it doesn't involve individual rights. It, it's, they, they've got fraternity and all, all these other things, but there's no God anywhere in that. We had God in ours from the center, and that was our paradigm. And it was significant that we've got a constitution in America, but the French Revolution is going on. The French Revolution, they had three revolutions. They had one in 1789, they had one in 1793, 1796. They ended up having 15 total since we've had our first. But Washington is president of the United States, and he's watched France go through three revolutions, and we're stable over here. I mean, we had come out of instability. We've now been stable. He gives his, his third and fourth annual address. He's talking about the unprecedented stability and prosperity in America. And here's France, turmoil after turmoil, turnover after turnover. And he, in his farewell address, which we used to study in school for generations, gave the warning and distinction of do not let that French mentality come here. The French say you can be moral through education, that we can just teach you what's right and wrong and you'll be great. Over here, we know that morality comes only through religion. And said what, what Washington said, he said, let us with caution, be really careful, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. In other words, French are saying, hey, you can be moral without religion. He says, you be really, really careful. That's a dangerous philosophy. He said, whatever may be conceded to the influence on ref, uh, refined education on minds and peculiar structure, what, whatever you think the power of education is to change the minds of kids, he said, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality will prevail in exclusion of religious principle. So he's saying if you go that direction, if you leave the religious principle out, you're not going to get the morality just from teaching. You will, not, you will not get it. And if you don't get the morality, you will never have national stability. You only have a stable nation when you have a moral nation. And morality only comes from not education. It comes from religion. And that's why Washington was very explicit. John Adams, two years later, same thing. John Adams is now in what's called the quasi-war with France. 1798, we're in the middle of this quasi-war with France. And he is speaking to the military of the state of Massachusetts. And in talking to them, he basically sums it up and says, listen, guys, you're great. You beat the British. You're really good. But you're not strong enough for what it would take to make people do what's right. He said, we have no government capable of restraining human passions are not controlled by religion and morality. If you can't control yourself by religion and morality, you guys in the military aren't tough enough to make everybody do what's right. You, you can never beat people in doing what's right if they won't choose to do it themselves. And so that was the way we understood it. And that was our duty. If we want to live in a free nation, we have a duty to be moral. We have a duty to be God-fearing. That's why we acknowledge God in the Declaration four times. We acknowledge our rights, individual rights, but they come from God. And if you lose that progression from God to us, to my responsibility to be moral, for, both for my society and for God, then you lose all your freedoms. Well, what do you do about that? A lot of people today would say, hey, I, I love freedom. I, I'm all for freedom and liberty and those things, but I don't want God in the equation. I, I can be a patriot without having God in the equation. You can be. George Washington specifically dealt with that in 1796 address. Now, you may think you can't, but it doesn't prove out that way historically. 1796 in his address, he looked at the prosperity America had, and Washington was present in what was called the Age of Revolution. So he not only had the French Revolution, he had the Russian Revolution, the Greek Revolution, the Italian Revolution. He's witnessing this firsthand. I mean, he's seen this happen. The whole world's in turmoil. And he's over here and saying, of all the habits and dispositions that lead to political prosperity, of everything that makes our, our politics prosper, he said religion and morality are indispensable supports. Religion and morality is what makes us different. He said, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars. So he's saying you cannot be a patriot. He said, I won't even let you call yourself a patriot if you try to separate religion from morality. That's what he said. John Witherspoon, a president of Princeton, founding father, signed the Declaration, trained so many other founding fathers, James Madison, said that he is the best friend to America who is most sincere in promoting pure and undefiled religion. He said, whoever is an enemy of God, I hesitate not to call him an enemy to his country. The founding father said, there's no way you can be called patriotic if you're going to be anti-God or secular. You have to at least be God-fearing. That doesn't mean you have to be a Christian. doesn't mean you right. have to go to church. But you've got to accept God's moral law and God's standards. You have to be God-fearing, which is why we acknowledge God on our currency. So we've understood that all along. And if we want those freedoms, we just cannot be a secular nation. If we enjoy our freedoms, we have duties we have to perform, and part of those duties are being moral and religious. All right, David, let's go to the audience for a question on this issue of duty.
why does it seem that so many more Americans were willing to sacrifice in earlier generations? Well, that's true. You think about the founders' lives, fortune, sacred honor. You think about the World War II generation, those that served in Korea, Vietnam, right on down the line. It does seem like prior generations gave more. At the risk of sounding simplistic, it's because we were a lot more biblical in those times. Mm -hmm. We, we really have some strong Bible teachings on the concept of duty and sacrifice above all costs, keeping your word no matter what it costs. And we've moved into, in some ways, a really shallow, really lazy form of Christianity where, oh, duty, I, I'm not under the law anymore. I, I'm, I'm free, but I'm under grace. And we've separated duty out. Now, I want to read a little passage from Luke 17. And verse 5, the apostle said, the Lord, increase our faith. We say this, we want to do what you do, increase our faith. And Jesus' answer is really pretty remarkable. He says, well, you have faith as a mustard seed. You, you can do this stuff, but here's the rest of the story. And so it starts in verse 7. He says, and which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep? Wait a minute, what was the question? I thought the question was increase our faith. And now he's taking them to an agricultural setting of plowing and tending sheep. Now, I got to stop right there for a minute because having grown up farming and ranching and being a cowboy myself, Plowing and tending sheep is pretty significant stuff. Uh, we still raise sheep. We're, right now to this day, we raise sheep. And anyone who thinks it's a compliment that we're called sheep in the Bible, don't know, they don't know a thing about sheep. That, that is the most ignorant animal that's ever existed. It's that's not an animal. easy day at the office. That is not an easy sheep. day at the office. Yeah. If, if I want them to go into this pen, they're going to go into this pen. I actually have to use sheep psychology on them. I try to give them the wrong pen so they go in the right pen. They're rebellious. They're, everything is wrong about sheep. So... What it says, a whole lot about the shepherd, but not a lot about the sheep. When, when it says that he's the great shepherd, that's significant. If you can put up with sheep 12, 14 hours a day, in a, in a farming or ranching life, we, as we said, you can you work from can see to can't see. You know, from time the light comes up, time it goes down. And if you have to trail those sheep around all day and they're wanting to go off on their own, you got to get them back. That is exhausting work. It's psychologically exhausting. It's physically exhausting. And if you've got to fight off the bears and the lions or whatever's coming after them, it's dangerous work. So it's not easy. So suppose one of you was tending sheep all day. Or by the way, suppose one of you was plowing. Now, I've done my share of plowing, but always on a tractor. I've never had to plow with a wooden plow falling behind oxen or, or behind mules or anything else. You do that all day long, you're worn out because you physically have to hold that plow. It's not the animal doing all of it. You're having to do a lot of keeping a balance. And like you said, it's all day. This is not it's nine to five, this is sun up, sun down. So it, the, the question is, Lord, increase our faith. And so he says, which one of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's coming from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. In other words, hey, servant, you've been, you've been working hard all day long. It's been grueling work. I know you're worn out. I know you're frustrated. I know you're tired. I know it's been tough. Why don't you sit down and get something to eat? Is that what happens when you have to sit? says, no. He says, will he not rather say to him, hey, prepare my supper. Gird yourself for me and serve me. And after I've eaten and drunk, then maybe you can eat and drink. So you've been doing a day-long work. You're now after dark. You come in. You're wore out. And your master says, hey, you're not done yet. You've got a second job going on here. You need to come take care of me. You you wait on me. You feed me. You take care of what I want. And then maybe if there's any time left over, you take care of yourself. So that's the next step. Then he says, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? So he's been in the field all day. He's now waiting on his master all night. And did the guy even tell him, thank you for being in the field all day or thank you for, for taking care of me? He said, no, he didn't thank him. He says, he says, did he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. He says, so likewise, when you've done all the things which you're commanded, you should say, we're unprofitable servants. We've done that, which is our duty to do. The answer is, if you want to increase your faith, if you want to be spiritually mature, you got to learn to work really hard, sometimes twice, have nobody thank you or this right here is one of my 18 audiobooks that I own. It made 82 sales last month on all. Or appreciate what you do, and you still keep doing it, and you say, hey, it was my duty. That's that's tough teaching there, David. I mean, I, I got to admit, you know, I'll, I'll go out there and I'll work hard. Maybe I'm helping my dad or somebody in the field. But I'm kind of thinking about, boy, they're really going to be happy I'm doing this. I yeah. want that praise. That's yeah. just our natural inclination. It's our natural inclination. I've seen do your duty, not looking for that praise, but just because it's your duty. And you do all these things and don't get thanked. And 
it's really hard to, to keep your marriage off the rocks and do all the things and, and get the kids and, and raise the kids and keep the income and take care of the family. And nobody says, thank you. Well, I'm quitting. No, you still do your duty. Even if nobody appreciates it, if nobody tells you, you still go out there and work your tail and you work really, really hard. Now that's the kind of biblical teaching that we instilled in previous generations. That's why the word duty was a big thing in previous generations. If you read the Founding Fathers' writings, you will find the word duty all over the place. Now, military still teaches the concept of duty, but they're probably about the only institution left in America that does. We don't teach it in the family. We don't, you, you can't get involved in adultery. You have a duty to be faithful. Well, we don't teach that. Well, they must have also been really teaching that within the church and the family because we didn't have a military yet. That's right. Yet when they were called upon, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, hey, people came out of the woodwork to say, I'll, I'll be part of it. That's exactly right. They had a right. sense of duty. They had a the sense of duty. That, and see, this is the other thing significant. Even the political realm, well, we used to call them public servants. We now call them public officials, and that's a terrible thing. We don't want officials. We want servants, yeah. public servants. And this is probably shocking for a lot of folks, but the way we used to choose political officials was we went into the ballot. At the time of the founding fathers, we went into a ballot box with a blank piece of paper. And we would say, um, for Senator, I, I want Rick Green for Senator. I'll write that down. Um, so there for, were names on the list. On you them. went in and said, these are the people these I think. These are the people so. I want. And then they would get all the ballots, count them all up, and said, oh, look, Rick Green got more requests than anybody else. They want you to be our, our, our mayor. And they go, Rick, uh, the people said they want you to be mayor. Will you be mayor? They would not allow you to say no because of what we taught. And, and Benjamin Rush is a great example. The signer of the Declaration, he pointed out from Romans 14.7, that no man lives and dies unto himself. If you've said no, it's because you're being selfish. You're saying, my life is mine. My life belongs to what I want to do. If they have called you to serve them, you can't say no, I'm not going to serve you. And that was characteristic of so many founding fathers. They didn't want to be in public life, but the people called them to it. They weren't putting themselves out there. They weren't saying, yeah, yeah, hey, 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 I'll be your leader. Yes, As a matter of fact, Sam Adams and Noah Webster and so many others said, if a person puts themselves forward for office, they're instantly disqualified. Wow. If you try to push yourself in office, we don't want you. That, that may be why, you know, sometimes we hear, where's Washington? Where's Adams? Where are the great leaders that we had of yesterday? You've got to go find them and shove them forward. Yeah. And Remember, you think of his humility, Washington. How many times he stepped down when he could have been king that's if right. he wanted And to. how many times did he resign? Yeah. You know, he kept resigning. And people kept sending but him back and said, we need you. He said, it's my duty. I'll go well, ahead. Patrick Henry is a great example. Patrick Henry, great founding father, governor of Virginia, was elected governor four times. And every time, blank ballot kind of thing. And people said, we want Patrick Henry. And after the fourth time, Henry said, everybody, listen, really, really good. I don't want to be governor again. I've got 19 kids. I've got 81 grandkids. I want to be home in Orange, Virginia. I want to be with the kid because he loved to play the fiddle with the kid. And I want to be home. Don't do this again. And they elected him for a fifth time to office, and he went back. I mean, it was the kind of thing where the, if they call you, you can't be selfish. And so that that concept, if your country calls you, I'm going to World War II, and it's a tough thing. If I'm called in the Civil War, I'm going I'm going to, to bat. I have to sacrifice that and be a servant. And that's why previous generations were so different from this generation, is we had a concept of duty, and we taught a, a concept that if you're not doing your duty, it's because you're selfish. All right, Dave, let's get another question from the audience. today still encourage certain character traits, but are they the same character traits we have always taught in America? Well, duty would be one of those character traits, right? Duty is one of the character traits, and in a lot of ways, the character traits have remained fairly constant. If you look at character curriculums that are out there today, they may have only seven or eight character traits in them, they may have as many as 70. So there's a lot of different character traits that are really necessary for full development of character as well as society, but what I find intriguing is in the founding era, they actually prioritized some of those traits. Good example is founding father Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration, considered one of the three most notable founding fathers. This is what John Adams called him. And so Benjamin Rush is a great educator, called the father of public schools under the Constitution. He started five universities, three still go today, et cetera. And in the curriculum that he would write, he talked you about. You say that like that's easy. Five universities. Five, five, five universities. universities. These guys were busy. Sorry, that's, yeah. that's a lot Which of is work. pretty amazing. And yeah. the fact that three of them survived 200 and some odd years later is amazing. amazing. And But he was really skilled in so many areas. I mean, he, he was in medicine, he was in chemistry, he was in so many things. But in talking about character traits, he said that he believed that there was one character trait that came to the top 
matter of fact, he said that he believed that that one character trait was the best way of defining people, whether they were alive or dead, and he said it was integrity. He says, I think I've observed that integrity takes a stronger hold of the human heart than any other virtue. Now, he said, by integrity, I mean a strict coincidence between thoughts and words and actions. In other words, integrity is when what I think, what I say, and what I do are all the same. And you can have political people who will say and do the right thing, but they don't think it. That's not integrity. Integrity at all levels is when I think, when I say, and I do the same thing. That integrity is very, very significant. Uh, I love the way that you tie it back to Psalms 15, verses 1 and 4. In, in that particular passage, Psalm 15, 1 and 4, uh, there's a question asked by David. It says, Lord, who will abide in thy holy hill? Who will dwell in thy tabernacle? God, who's going to be with you? Answer in verse 4. He that keeps his oath even to his own hurt. In other words, when you give your word, you'll keep your word no matter how much it hurts you. Now, that trait of integrity is what we see throughout the Founding Fathers. These 56 guys that signed the Declaration signed on the dotted line, if you will. It was an oath. It was an oath. They said, we give our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor to see America be an independent nation. Well, that's okay if you have the world's greatest military, but they don't. They don't have an army. They don't have a navy. They do not have economic resources. They are taking on the world's most powerful military. What's significant about the founders, 56 founding fathers, you cannot find one example of any of them breaking their word. Never once. And, and so seven of these guys never lived to see what they wanted us to enjoy. 17 of them lost all of their fortunes and estates keeping their word. Three lost their wives. Three lost their kids. Abraham Clark, New Jersey, great example. Here he is in Congress, member of Congress, founding father. The British capture his two sons. The two sons were put in the British prison ship in Jersey, and that's a death camp. Nobody came out of that place alive, and everybody knew that. There were three prisons the British had that were death camps. And so here's Abraham Clark sitting in Congress. The British get word to him and say, hey, we've got your two sons. Here's the deal. If you'll renounce your signature on the Declaration, we'll let your two boys back, because you know what's going to happen to them. So if you renounce your signature, well, mm. Abraham Clark thought about it about that long and said, mm, no, I gave my word. I can't go back on my word. Not even save the life of his son. I don't know if I could do that. That, that you know, these guys understood that that they, when they made that sacrifice, when they made that promise, it wasn't just showing up at a rally and signing a petition and going home and forget right. forget about it. I mean, they knew they were going to have to follow through to and that's make a that kind of trait. sacrifice. That's, that's a character. And by the way, that's a character trait of God. I mean, God keeps His word no matter what. Mm -hmm. He keeps His word if it costs the life of His own sons. Mm -hmm. Aren't we glad that God keeps His word? Yeah. I mean, even if it costs the life of His son. So keeping your word at all costs, whether it's marital fidelity, whether it's in, in business, whether it's an agreement or a contract, whatever it is, you give your word, you keep your word. That is the number one character trait. That's a trait that made America strong. That's a trait we're going to have to have to keep America strong. Okay, Dave, time for one more question on duty. Aside from voting, how else can I be involved in the civil arena? Sometimes it's a challenge just to get people to vote. Now we're getting people asking, okay, I can vote. What else can I do? Well, probably the answer to that is a twofold approach, and sometimes it's both. But you have to understand this difference between politics and policy. Politics is the means whereby you elect someone to office. Policy is the process whereby you make the laws and make the policies after that person's elected. And a lot of times the two things do not touch. Like a congressional guy will have two separate staffs. I mean, if you're elected to the House or the Senate, you'll have a policy staff, you'll have a politics staff. So on the one hand, you can get involved on the politics side. You can work in the campaign, you can vote, uh, you can find a, a good God-fearing person and say, hey, they need help to get elected, so we're gonna work. There were campaigns that, that we ran uh, where we would actually find Christian kids, homeschool kids from Christian universities or Christian schools, whatever. And in the last 14 days, 10 days of a campaign, we specifically looked at national races where someone would be one point up or one point down really close. And we'd take 100 Christian kids and would bust them into that campaign. And this website visitors bouncing? Stress less. Convert more. Try Hotjar. And it's been two weeks there, or maybe a week there, 
and they would work, they'd pass out literature, they'd make calls, they would stand on the corners with signs, whatever. Because that's one that's close enough where a big push like that That's right. get your candidate on the 100 home. Christian kids, and we won five out of every six races doing right. that. So it was enough to push it. That's a really big deal. If you've got a godly person who going to the U.S. Senate or the, the House of Representatives, I mean, get involved well, that, in their campaign. And that's and that's sometimes young people that aren't even old enough to vote yet. That's right. About. Oh, so they, 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 they can still vote. Well, you betcha. Yeah. Uh, they can be 12 years old and be sticking stamps on envelopes. Everybody can get trained for that really early. But sometimes we think that's the end of it for us as citizens. If I vote or I influence the election, once the election's over, now there's nothing I can do because right. they're in session. Is that true? Not true. That's where you go down to your local state rep or state senator. You, you go down to your congressional office say, hey, I've got an hour a week I'd love to give you guys. It's unbelievable how yeah. they'll respond to that, how impressed they are. Oh, man, yeah, if you take this mail or look at this or look at these phone calls or maybe call this guy back and That's tell right. him this, it makes a, and then what it does is it creates a relationship with you and that member. And when you have a relationship, you have a louder voice than when you don't have a relationship. That's right. And so that's an easy thing to do on the policy side. So you can get involved in the politics side or the policy side or you can do something like recruit someone to run for office. Yeah. You know, that school board's got to change. I, and I know a guy I go to church with that'd be really cool on the school board, and he'd be the deciding vote or whatever. Recruit someone for school board or for state rep or for mayor or city council or public utility district that you recognize in them the potential to be a great leader. You got to do this. We need you. I mean, you're exactly what we want on city council or whatever. Or so you may be the one that they're exactly. coming to, right? I mean, you said earlier, exactly. you were talking about how the, the founding fathers were willing to go. They were willing to sacrifice. When That's right. Upon. So if somebody watching right now is the one that others are coming to saying, hey, you'd be really good at school board or whatever, be willing to don't say yes. Don't blow it off and say, oh, no, no. Don't, don't be selfish. Your life doesn't belong to yourself. If you can serve your community, if you can serve constituents, and be a servant, be a God-minded servant. That's exactly what you want to do. So there's a lot of ways to be involved. Sometimes it's a matter of looking at legislation and letting people in your church know, hey, you need to call about this bill right. or about this issue. Sometimes it's creating voter guides. I know people that, that live in, in a community, and they will look at everybody on the ballot, and they'll go down and say, well, I'm going to vote for these guys, and then they'll copy that, and they'll pass it out to every neighbor say, you may not know who's in this election, but I've really studied all these guys, and let me show you who I'm going to vote for. And people, neighbors love right they, they, they like do. That. And David, we should share with our viewers, ChristianVoterGuide.com is a great That's resource right. for people. If they want to fulfill Whatever that role, state you're in. want to be the one sharing it, That's you can right. go to that particular website and click on your state. You get a voter's guide for your state, and you can pass that out to all your neighbors, which is it's good information. It's like rebuilding the wall with Nehemiah. There's yeah. a lot of places on that wall. Not everyone's the same, and you don't have to look like everybody else that does it. You're not rebuilding the same part. But find a place on the wall get involved and do something to rebuild the country all right cool all right okay i just wanted to find something real quick okay any uh any comments or questions um uh, uh, before i get into this you can unmute yourself talk to me any questions comments uh, i'm struggling uh, i'm struggling good. Uh, who's struggling? Alicia? I am. Yeah. Oh. Um, when he said integrity, um, I thought about the slavery issue and I said, hmm, these are guys who have integrity? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, you got to understand this. Number one, we are talking about the 1700s. One of the things that I tell my history students is that you can't take 2022 and take it back to 17. Uh, whatever it is. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. that I'm not saying no, that. I'm just saying it in the context of what he was saying, you know, that these are men who had integrity. And I'm just saying is that when I, I look back, I, Go ahead, I just struggle. That. I just struggle with what's, them. What's your point of struggle, first of all? Okay. Integrity. When you say, when you say these men. Who... So I'm talking about the founding fathers and all these well, how many, how many families? Okay, all right, never mind. No, 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 don't, no, no, don't, no, no, let's work. No, through. you won't, you won't. Yes, I will, I know exactly no. where you're coming from because I used to think the same thing, but let me show you, let me tell you something, hold up. Just work okay. with me, here, okay, work with me. Okay. How many founding fathers were they? Um, I don't know, but I got a book I can tell you. All right, actually it's about 256. Now, okay, I got a book I can signers, tell you. Now, those signers of the Declaration of Independence. Right. How many of them own slaves? Probably three or four of them. Well, it, it was a small percentage. Now, how many of them were Christians and theologians that were trying to do away with slavery? Uh, I, 
don't know the exact number, but there were some. It was about a third, okay? Mm -hmm. Dr. Just keep hearing Dr. Benjamin Rush. Mm -hmm. He was very eminent. When you go back and you, and, and some of our past lessons, we talked about that. Right. And how they, were, they were trying to, they, they were, they, there was a division which would eventually erupt in civil war. Right. Because there was a failure to come to some kind of, uh, of a remedy for slavery. Mm -hmm. now, what happens in the original uh, writing of the, of the Declaration of Independence, there were two clauses in there that dealt with the abolition of slavery too. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the original, but you'll see they were crossed out. And you say, why? Well, number one, they had to get this document done. They had to fight the British. The South was saying, well, we're not gonna fight if you don't leave. So what happened, they had to, and we as Christians, we don't do this. They compromised. And what we see from the time of the birth of this country, Declaration, there was compromises, 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 until finally we get to the 18, 1861, 18, and it gets to the point where compromise, and this tells us, number one, why we can't compromise. When you compromise with the enemy, all you're doing is putting off conflict later down the road, and it's going to be worse than if you had dealt with it. But of course, they're living in that particular time doing what they had to do. We got to always right. remember that. And it's easy to look back and say, well, they could have did this, they could have did that. But guess what? Somebody's going to look back on us 100 years from now and say, well, why didn't they do this? And why didn't yeah. they do that? And why didn't they get the squeegee boys off? On and why didn't they deal with this lesbian LBGT thing? Why are we still, you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. Because we are, we're in the moment. So yeah, mm -hmm. I understand exactly what you're saying. But when you're dealing with history, you have to deal with the facts. What was, right? okay? That's just okay. it, that's just the way it was. But okay. you will see when you really get into it, that there were always those in the government that were trying to force, that's where you get the abolitionist movement from mm -hmm. in the 1800s. The, the church and Christians were always pushing and trying to deal with this thing of slavery. Well, what, oh, happened, yes. what happened in government, and all you got to do now is look over to DC and get an idea of what take. But anyway, that's another point. But what that's you see, point. what you see is you keep seeing compromises, mm -hmm. compromises, 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 and then finally the Civil War. Right, right. But um, but uh, also too, in my heart, I know that. You only, a person is only going to, like people profess a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, those who are in politics, they, they profess a lot. You know, I'm this, I'm that, just to get your vote. I mean, it doesn't seem to be a lot of integrity. And the other thing is that a person, you can only know a person as much as they are willing to allow themselves to be known. Yeah, that's right. Wow. But here's the thing, notice what he was saying. Mm -hmm. If we find the candidates, right? Remember in the last lesson to say if we elect people who are people of integrity and have a uh, you know a, a biblical worldview or whatever, uh, um, and 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 so then we don't have to say you know we don't have to um, lobby them and and like this woman who's speaker of the house, I mean she's going to push this abortion bill back through again, and she's there smiling, and. I, I, as my dad would say, and I bet you a fat man that on Sunday, she sits up in somebody's church. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as we, uh, Camille looked up the, the pastor of Westmore and what that, uh, that's how I got that. She, Camille, search, she searches stuff and <laughs> found out, well, what, what is it? What are they preaching down there? Climate change, climate activism, not evangelism. Okay not solid Bible teaching like we get, climate change and how to be a climate change activist. That's what the theme is in their church, okay? And, 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 and also remember this, my dad taught me a lot of stuff that he did not necessarily do himself. <laughs> but what he taught me yeah. helped to make me grow into manhood, mm -hmm. okay? And so, yes, there's some flaws there, but those words 
we take those words today and they mean a whole lot. Um, I was talking to my, uh, my homeschool just before we came on and, and we do Bible reading. We were reading uh, through the gospel of John and, and John, John 15, 13, I think it says, uh, Jesus says, um, uh, mm, mm, I, I'm going blank. I got to go to it. I can't. Greater love has no man than to lay down his life for a friend. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and what does that take? That takes sacrifice. Someone, yes. And then we look at, at, at Jesus and, and we go into Romans. It says what? God commanded his love toward us is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Not because we were so good. Mm -hmm. At that point, we were so bad. But Jesus saw that as his duty. Yes. Okay? That was, that's why he came. And so let's carry this over into the church. Let's bring it in, into Genesis. We have folk who serve in many different capacities. Two and, they do two and three things because they see it as their duty. They understand Christ saved me. Boy, somebody comes to me and says, hey, we need you to do this. And they'll go, okay, I got it. I'll take it. But you approach some people and you say, you know what? We really need somebody to do this. And they'll go, I got to pray about it. I'll, be, I'll get back to you. Uh, all right. In the meantime, something's going undone because they see it as an inconvenience and what have you. Um, let, me, let me just share it with you. And, and, and I'm going to get back to this. But I understand exactly what you're saying, Elise, because I used to think the same way. Okay. But. Again, as a, as a, a history teacher and reader and, and getting into stuff, I just understand is, look, that's, that was what happened. And we can't deal with that in, in our frame of mind. Uh, what was that thing? Mr. Peabody and Sherman, remember in the Wayback Machine? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Okay, we could go back to the Wayback Machine. We could go back to 1770s. <laughs> then we could, you know, what would we uh -huh. do? Okay. But, but here's the thing, and, and we talk about duty. When I came, and I had this written in my notes, when I came to Genesis, I came from another church and, um, and I, I, I told Camille, I said, you know, uh, <laughs> this is what I said. This, I said, Camille, I'm never gonna join another all black church. I've had it with these Baptist folks. I'm done. Really? So yeah, so when I came when I came <laughs> when I came to Genesis, and uh, as a matter of fact, I had heard Pastor Cockrell on the radio, and Camille bought me a tape that he had, and I said, "Oh, I remember him. Let's go to his church." And Sister Lee goes in; she worked with Camille. Anyway, so I show up at Genesis, and 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 the first thing I do is I look on the, the calendar that was on the door, and I did not see Men's Day, Women's Day, Flower Circle anniversary, and I said, "Okay, we I'm going on in. Okay, I'm going in," and then. I get in there and pastor comes out and he pre I said, oh, yeah, that's him. But then uh, Camille said, you remember what you said? But then there was a guy, some of you might remember Pastor Mike. Yeah. And mm -hmm. His children. Yeah. And I said, this is the church. And Camille said, but I thought, I said, I didn't say how many. <laughs> yeah. let me, no, but let me tell you how God works. Watch this. After I became a part of Genesis and you know, and, 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 you know, began to, you know, uh, went through the new members class and all that, got right hand of fellowship and all that. Guess what? God calls Pastor Mike to another church to preach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, Lord, see, see, they can switch. And Camille is cracking up because, you know, mm -hmm. but the other thing I said was, I'm not getting involved in anything. So I got on the, <laughs> Good Samaritan ministry or something where you just hold a bag. You ain't had to do nothing. <laughs> All right. Cause I ain't, I ain't venturing nowhere. And Camille said, well, I said, look, this is it. Okay. I'm carrying this bag every fourth Sunday. That's it. I'm done. I've had it. And vacation Bible school comes around. Sister Evelyn Gotti was the coordinator. She goes to Camille. And she says, Camille, we need a teacher for the adult VBS class. Mm. Do you think mm -hmm. Cliff could do that? 
And Camille goes, oh yeah, yeah, he could do that. Yeah, 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 he's a good teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is behind my back, I don't know. So Sister Evelyn shows up in front of me and now those of you who know Sister Evelyn, she got this smile. Yes. You already got your hook. All right. <laughs> she said, uh, Brother Cliff, I would like to know if you would be available to teach our adult BBS class. And I'm like, see, Lord, you, 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 you don't see you did you're doing it again. You're doing it again. And I had a choice. I could say no. And then have to stand before the Lord. And he tells me, look, I called you to do something and you said no. Mm -hmm. But I said, okay, Sister Evelyn, I'll do it. Why? Judy. Mm -hmm. Judy. Mm -hmm. Judy. And the rest, as they say, is history. So here I am mm -hmm. now. Okay. And let me tell you something else. When I was at my old church, I taught Bible study. We get two or three people that would show up on a Tuesday night. And I was ready to like, I ain't doing this. But I still did my lessons as though there were 30 or 50 people. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I did my duty because, you know, I was a deacon there and I was asked to do that by the pastor. And I did it mm -hmm. faithfully every Tuesday. But here's the thing. Down the road, the, the Lord called me to teach at the Baltimore School of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Suppose I had said no. Suppose I quit. Suppose I said, Lord, I ain't doing this. Mm -hmm. Wasting my time. Mm -hmm. You got no time anyway. Time is his. Right. <laughs> so that, that thing about duty, when we, when we talk about it, we people serve at Genesis because they, they think, because they feel it's their duty. They understand mm -hmm. How the price that 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 God gave, He gave His Son, He gave the best He had to save us. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And when yeah. someone comes and says, "We need this," and you realize, man, you know, here's my opportunity to contribute. It is my duty. One of the things that amazed me is that every war that America has been in, African Americans felt it was their duty to enlist, mm -hmm. even though they were dealing with discrimination, segregation, mm -hmm. but they said, it's our duty. Because they said, well, if the other guys win, we're going to be in worse shape than we are now. Mm -hmm. OK, but they, my, my father, you know, enlisted. They, my uncles, they, they enlisted. Yeah. Why? They felt it was their duty. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I understand like, that. I mean, my, my dad served in World War II yeah. and um, his brother, um, he lied to get in. He yeah. didn't even tell the truth about his age. Yeah, my mother, my mother, one of my mother's cousins was killed in World War II in Italy. But, you know, that's the thing. OK, but let me let me get to this and, and let's look at some Bible stuff. Mm -hmm. Bible stuff. Oh. <laughs> let me let me get to some um, some Bible verses. Uh, uh, when we talk about duty, and 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 again, when we talk about integrity, okay, and 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 when and when I think about the word integrity, uh, of course, I always think about Jesus first, mm -hmm. okay, because um, he he kept his word. He he went to the cross. Right. He was obedient even mm -hmm. unto death. And so when I look at that, and and. First of all, I look at, at the men around me, the, the men at Genesis that uh, when, when we talk about pastor, when I talk about Minister Arnell, Minister Mosley, Minister Carpenter, uh, um, uh, Pastor Robert Williams, man, those men, they're men of integrity. Mm -hmm. They say it and they stand on it and they do it. Mm -hmm. And then the leadership team, you know, uh, Deacon Buck, and, and Ben and 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 Daryl and, and Bryce and, and and those guys, those you know, those are the guys that I'm around all the time. I'm close to them, and why? Because they are men of integrity, and that makes me want to be a man of integrity with mm -hmm. them. And and, mm -hmm. they, and and they're men who serve. They're men who serve. They got called. They answered the call. It was their duty. Mm -hmm. they, they saw mm -hmm. it as, I'm in, I'm in. I wanna, I wanna make Genesis 
better. I want to add something to it mm -hmm. rather than coming mm -hmm. in. One, one words me says, if you find a perfect church, don't join it. Because mm -hmm. it won't be perfect. Sure. He did say that. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, too, what are you bringing right. to mm -hmm. the ministry rather than what do you want from the ministry? Right. We get some people that, that come in and what they want is what can I get from this? What can I get out of this? Can I get some food? Can I get this? Can I get that? Uh, what, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they, what, what yeah. They, when you come, what are you bringing? Right. What do you bring? And I found out you can't hide from God. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I once told somebody that somebody came to me and said, uh, God's got plans for you. I said, look, let me tell you something. I'll come to church 11 to 1. And then after that, it's the NFL on CBS. Don't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they did? They laughed in my face and turned around and walked away. <laughs> Evidently, they did know more than I know. But anyway, scripture, mm -hmm. when we talk about duty, Romans 12, 1. Mm. Go there, go there. Romans 12, 1. Okay, if, if you were in um, in my class at the Baltimore School of Bible and Romans, this is one of the memory verses. Ain't that right, Mo? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Amen. That's one of the memory <laughs> verses, right? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, let, me give you another, let me give you another example. When we talk about uh, duty, Minister Mosley went to Baltimore School of Bible. I came in and, and recruited you, didn't I, Mo? Sure did. I said, they said, we need a teacher. We need a Bible teacher. I said, I got the guy for you. I think I, I think when I graduated, said, hey, man, there's a slot at the Baltimore School of the Bible, and he yeah, took I think, it. I think when I graduated, you handed me my teacher packet before I got my certificate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Carlos Brown, another yeah. one. Carlos was one of my students. Same thing with him. Say we need a teacher. I, but he, I got the man for you. Carlos Brown, Carlos Brown, hooked them right up. Okay, uh, we're, we're known as the G Man. They and 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 the, and the students just compliment them and talk about them. Um, you know, I hear you know I hear from some of the we have some of the same students, and you know they'll mention their names and and and, and they have impeccable rec reputations. Um, people talk about how highly skilled they are, how dedicated they are. Yeah. And, and so when the call came, they answered the call, okay? But look at Romans 12, 12, one and two. And, 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 and when you look at it, before you get to Romans 12, one, go back up one to 11, 36. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and it said, for well, of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. I mean, no, go back a little bit more. Verse 33, that's where I want to go. Okay. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? That's, that's a question for you. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And then Paul comes right behind. Look what he says. Mm -hmm. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is, I love this, which is your reasonable service. When God has called you, to do something he has already equipped you to do it he's not and pastors preach this many many times he does not send you into a situation with no skills quote no skills no gifts you just in there on your own is no uh-uh that's not what he does he tells you that's your reasonable service and then verse two he says and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that me you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? He tells us. That's it. That's our duty. What's our duty? Present our bodies a living sacrifice. Okay. When, when we go to, uh, what was it? Isaiah. Isaiah 6, 8. 
And on the notes, when you get them, there's some scriptures at the end that I listed there, okay? For this, and we'll get to some, okay? Okay, uh, 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 Isaiah chapter six, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna start at verse one, because I don't like to just snatch a verse, but I'm gonna put it in its context, okay? And Isaiah writes, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, I am lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Verse three, and one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse four, and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone mm. because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse six, then one of the seraphim flew to me having a hand in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongues from the altar and he touched my mouth with it and he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Here it is, verse eight. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Send me. When the call comes and God reaches out and says, I need you to do this. I need you to do this. I need you to serve here. And notice he understood when he saw God, the Lord lifted up. He saw the power of God, the glory. How are you going to say no? Mm. You know, as my friend Spencer goes, duh. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, high and mighty, almighty God. Look, I don't have time for you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I got things to do, uh, my career and all this and, and what have you and, and all this and I, I just ain't got time. Not realizing that when you answer his call, he's gonna take everything, he's gonna yes. put everything else in place. <laughs> and I'm yeah. a witness to that, I'm a witness to that. Yeah. Serve him first. He puts everything in place behind you because you're in the center of his will. You, that duty, that duty. And then attaching that, you serve in that capacity with integrity. Mm -hmm. Your word, your word must be straight. And so when we look at, at Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul tells us, present your bodies, a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable yeah. service. But one way that uh, I, I'm a student of history, I love it. And uh, oh, hey, Cliff. And one way I deal with the in, inequities of the past is, you know, you, you look and see what the Bible says. And, right, right. and the Bible, you know, I, I say this to myself, you know, all the time. The uh, Lord says he will repay. Vengeance is mine. And, mm -hmm. and it also says that we're not supposed to worry and live in the past. Because there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, of course, you know, you don't like what, what's happening and stuff. But that uh, helps uh, settle me. I remember when Roots first came out and in, uh, in the school, and uh, I was I was in college then I think yeah, and uh, but my uh, sister sister in law came from school and uh, she said the principal said now look we all watched Roots last night but it's not going to be any fights in the school, so um, I just go biblical and. And of course, that straightens me out. Yeah, also, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in Ezekiel, it also says that 
the sins of the father should not be laid on the sons. And and other thing I, I tell my history students too, look, on their best days, who are we dealing with? Mm -hmm. We're dealing with people. Yeah. Okay. We're dealing with people. It's uh, left, it's 130. I'll give you the 130 mark. All right. Okay. Let me let me just uh run this by real quick. Uh 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 and and uh and then give me five more minutes. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, th this is from U.S. History textbook, faith-based, um, and this is um, at the end of the Civil War, and the, 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 the topic or this section of the textbook is entitled, The Mysteries of Providence. Now, back in the 1800s, when we talk about providence, they're, they're really referring to God, but then you will see providence in, in those areas' writings, but this is what it says. Listen to this. It says, the war forced people to struggle to understand the mysteries of providence. Early in the war, Northerners were puzzled at their military failures. If their cause was right, why was God not giving them victory? Later in the, year, in the war, Southerners were distraught at their defeats. How could God ignore prayers of godly men like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson? Some people on both sides lost faith in God. Others decided that God does not always reward those in the right. Now here it is. Lincoln's view was different. In the middle of the war, Lincoln reasoned that God's ways are not always people ways. He said, in great contests, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be and one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. Mm. That's true. And there's something. Yeah. God is, he, look, he's doing something that we can't even, you know, we can't even handle it. Why did he allow this? How come it's gone? Because guess what? He's still working his plan. Amen. He's still, right. he's still yes. working his plan. Yes. And all we do what is just when he calls, we answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh let, let me let me do uh one more scripture and then and then we're gonna get to um uh go go to Matthew 25. Oh, this is really good. I, you know what? When, and and uh, uh, Deacon Moses, you could probably concur to this. When you teach a class, you never know how it's going to go. Sure. Am I right? You 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 it's think exactly in your right. mind it's going to go this way, and you're going to cover this point, and you're going to cover that point, and it's like, nope, 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 nope. I'm not taking you that way, brother. Mm -hmm. See, preaching a message, you just never know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> what do you say? I so even when you're preaching the message, you just sometimes you just don't know. You, know? They just don't you got know. notes, but sometimes the Lord takes it another way. I tell you, it's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Matthew 25. Okay, 31. Okay, and uh, okay, somebody can read like uh, mm -hmm. oh, wait, let me make sure I got it. Mm -hmm. That has to do with the Son of Man coming in his glory. Is that yeah, the one? It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and okay. all the holy angels with him, then mm -hmm. he will sit on the throne of his glory. Mm -hmm. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another mm -hmm. as a shepherd divides his sheep from the go goats. Mm -hmm. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. well, I'm hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Mm -hmm. Then the righteous will answer, him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Mm -hmm. When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? 
or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you curse it into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Look, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me, me sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away in everlasting punishment, mm -hmm. but the righteous into eternal life. And when mm -hmm. we talk mm -hmm. about duty, when we look at mm -hmm. duty as a Christian, we see what? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the, the, the women who, who put bags together for the homeless mm -hmm. women to take that. Why? It was their duty. They saw it as that. God mm -hmm. has called us. This is what we got to do. This mm -hmm. is what all this for and 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 it's no big fanfare the the, the christmas boxes uh that that went out uh that that uh, sister cheryl and, and minister mosley were working on those thousands of boxes that went out that was so much fun yeah all over the world <laughs> all over <laughs> the world imagine yes. and why who because some mm -hmm. people here thought it was their duty Yes. Had a duty mm -hmm. to do something and in 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 october the gideons we had the baltimore blitz we had Gideons come from Pennsylvania, Delaware, mm -hmm. Virginia. They came here to Baltimore, rent, took hotel rooms, and stayed for days as we distribute scriptures to nursing homes, 3,000 to school children. They took that time. Why? Duty. It is our duty. God has called. He's asked mm -hmm. us to do something. We yeah. respond. Yes. Okay. yes. Go yes. ministry. Why did the go ministry go? Mm. Duty. duty to share the gospel. Uh, yeah, it's our duty mm. to spread the gospel. Yeah. And that's why, and, and, and in this other context, as citizens, we have a duty to be informed, to know what's going on, to mm -hmm. educate our neighbors, our friends. Yes, pray is fine, yes. but then put some legs on that prayer. Mm -hmm. All right? And, 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 and why? Because it's our duty. And Pastor preached this a, a while back. We are salt and light. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if we ain't out there, mm -hmm. we're gonna get like we got now, folk like Adrian, who's gonna press this bill. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so if you um, um, uh, emails, uh, Sister Paul is just sending you the notes and there's some other scriptures uh, on there, okay? And so with that, let us let me close in prayer and we'll start taking our prayer requests uh, real quick. Any other any other comments or questions? Real quick, I like uh, Romans 14, 7 and 8. I thought that was a good point that the speaker shared. He said, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. That's right. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Down state. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so uh, you, you you can't just you know be saved and be solo. Okay, mm -hmm. God's giving you that gift. If you're not using that gift, somebody's lacking in the body because mm -hmm. they need what you have. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about anybody, but I always said I don't want to stand before the Lord one day, and He say, "Well, Cliff, I." Mm -hmm. Had, I wanted you to do this, but you turned it down. And so look what happened. But th there's also a song that Brother Spencer relates to. Uh, it's called Thank You. Mm -hmm. and, and it's about also uh, about giving. That's what it related to. It's about thank you for giving to the Lord because of your giving. The gospel went out and somebody got saved. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the other thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, we rejoice. We, we met our goal. This year, why mm -hmm. people gave? Why? Because they felt it was their duty to give. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And when you do your mm -hmm. duty, you don't think about it. You just go do it. Okay. Parents do their duty for their children. Mm -hmm. Fathers, wives do your duty. Husbands do your duty. My duty when I was growing up was to go to school and get my schoolwork done. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay, that was my duty. Okay, and and so we see it all down the line that duty yes. sport. when people do it. Prosperity, there's peace, there's hope, you get the negative side. All right, let's pray. And if you have any uh, other questions, you can email me, wctomlin at verizon.net, or you can call me, okay? And, uh, okay, let's pray. Most gracious God, our eternal Father, as we come again, we just want to thank you for this time that we've had, uh, the discussions, but we noticed that Every time it always leads back to your word. What does the Bible say? And I remember Minister Carpenter in, in his uh, lessons that he did, what we will not be silent. Is it right? Is it right? Is it right? And Lord, we know that when we're serving you, we know it's right. And so we just pray now and we thank you uh, that it's an honor to serve you. And, uh, we just pray now and, and thank you for the fact that you allowed us, as Pastor said, you, you have called on imperfect people mm -hmm. to help take part to work in a perfect plan. And again, as Isaiah said, he said, whoa, am I? I'm, look, I'm, I'm looking at the majesty of God and, and I'm, 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 I'm a person of unclean lips. I did the well. Of And, and even some of us were men at holy. I remember uh, uh, Clarence Morton said, I wouldn't choose me if I had to choose me, knowing me. But Lord, that's not how you operate. And I'm so glad you did because I wouldn't be sitting here today. And so Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we have the opportunity to serve a God who gave his only son, who came and shed his precious blood to pay the penalty for our sins that we would go free that we would have eternal life. You said that Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The blessings that we have, the access to your throne, to call upon you, to talk to you, the, uh, to, to worship you, to be among people of like-minded faith, to be encouraged, to be loved, to be exhorted. Father, you are, you, you, it's just amazing. You set up things, Lord, for our good. And we just thank you today. So grateful, so thankful that even in all this craziness, Lord, you are the only stable thing in our lives. You are the same yesterday. Today will be the same tomorrow. And so we thank you, Lord, that what we've learned today about duty and about integrity, that when people see us, when other people look at us, what do they see? If we profess to be your children, as pastor said, we ought to be looking like you, but we ought to be acting like you too. And so Father, again, we thank and praise you for all that you've done. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Good evening to everyone. I trust that it is well with your soul. We know Jesus Christ as Savior. It is well with our soul. We have entered into his rest. Amen. But we have to flesh it out. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do so. That's, I'm going to read from the book of Acts, chapter 5. Still in chapter 5, I'm going to read this time from verse 22 to verse 32. Reading from the New King James Book of Acts, New King James Translation. And uh, after I read it, we shall pray. But when the officers came and did not find them in prison, they returned and reported, saying, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the door. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Verse 26. Then the captains went with the officers and brought them without violence, 
but they feared the people, at least they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on the tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And when we are his witnesses, and we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day, a day that we have not uh, gone without uh, experiencing your presence with us, your power that you have given to us to move and breathe and have our very being, and the love that you have shown toward us that we can ponder on, that cause joy to come into our heart and remain. We thank you again for we know that we were a people cut off from the promises of Israel with no hope, a people in the world with no hope. And it's amazing, it's amazing and almost uh, unthinkable that the holy God as you are, Heavenly Father, and righteous as you are, would consider man and then would uh, counsel with the Godhead and send God the Son, the on, your only begotten Son into the world, made lower than the angels, to live among sinners and at the appointed time go to Calvary and suffer and die at the hands of those whom he knew before they were made and put into their mother's womb. We are amazed at your goodness toward us. We thank you for the giving of the body and the shedding of the blood of Jesus because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. We thank you that you made his soul sin for us all. That part, Heavenly Father, you wounded him for our transgressions. We were guilty. He was guiltless. We thank you that he had descended into the abyss where all sinners belong. And each one of us who, at the sound of my voice, belong in the same place. I can speak for myself. But he was there for three days as he promised and was raised the third day, having overcome death in the grave, having paid the debt that we owed. And you accepted his work on our behalf because he was raised. Not that you overlooked our sin, but he has been, we, we were justified. Our sin that was paid for in full, our sin was put on him and his righteousness was, is imputed to us that we, O oh Lord, might be the children of the living God today in the world. That we might stand and having done all stand in the presence of the Almighty God by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you again for the ministry of Jesus who ministered in the earth after his resurrection for 40 days and ascended to thy right hand, sending the Holy Spirit to finish the work that he, he begun, forming Christ's likeness in us. As we go from place to place in our families and our community and, our, and in the marketplace, Christ ought to be seen in us, not that we can, can, can perfect it or not that we can even Reveal it, but the Holy Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, he can show us to be who we claim to be, that is, children of the living God, Christians. So thank you again for this great privilege you have restored upon us. Help us tonight to understand and cause us to think deeply and cause the Holy Spirit to stir up in us a hunger and a thirst for you. Yes, we can see you through your word, but we want to draw nigh to you. Cause our hearts to have to, to have a thirst for you and a hunger and a thirst for you as a as a deer painted after water in a dry and thirsty land where there is none, where there is no water. Bless our time tonight together. We're gonna to praise you for it right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, as I'm going to uh, encourage you tonight to, as I always do, as we proceed in our study. You have something to encourage us and each one of us uh, or 
something that can add to this study tonight. We pray that you will share with us and just indicate to Sister Paula, and she'll indicate that uh, take you all, and you'll be able to come in and share with us. We appreciate that. Uh, uh, so uh, we're going to start the beginning by a comment that I, about the Holy Spirit that I'm going to share with you from uh, uh, Charles Stanley, who's a who's a, who's wrote a book on on the uh, Holy Spirit. And I told, as I said, when we started off, we were not studying the, the book that, Ch that Dr. Stanley has written, although it would be a good study if someone, at well, some point in time, maybe we go from someone would take it upon themselves or be encouraged to share Dr. Stanley's wisdom and his 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 uh, work concerning the Holy Spirit. But this is this is a uh, this is uh, about you and I as believers being aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That, that's that's what this is about, our awareness of the Holy Spirit with us today and what he is doing today. But I like what Dr. Stanley had to say about the Holy Spirit as he guides us today. This is what he says. He says, uh, the emphasis is on the word God. Uh, Jesus doesn't promise that the Holy Spirit will control us. He doesn't promise that he will drive us he doesn't prom he doesn't say that the Holy Spirit will force us to do anything. He says he will guide us. And he's speaking of uh he's referencing of John 16, 13, which read, but when the when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And he will make he will we will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose it to you what is to come. That's what he's referring to. And he goes on to say, granted, there are times when I wish the Holy Spirit would come, would control me. For instance, when I'm tempted or when I become so task oriented that I become insensitive. And that's a, that, 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 for those of us who study the word a lot, we, we need to be aware of that. Or when it is a beautiful Saturday afternoon and I need to study, but everything in me wants to grab my camera and head for the mountains. Life would be be much easier, and I would be a much more enjoyable person if the Holy Spirit would reach out and take control of me. But that is not the case. He is our guide, not our controller. At no point do we lose our ability to choose to follow his leading. Consequently, we are always, always responsible for our word and our action. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is, is, is referred to as a comforter in the scripture was also referred to as a helper. And so today we're going to continue looking at our PowerPoint presentation. We can pull it up, uh, share our screen. It was all about political gain is what, I, what, 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 we, what we found out uh, last week. We can we keep on going back to that because one of the studies that we done before we started, this particular study was with uh, Dr. Lutzer, his point was he was not seeking to re, he said he wasn't, his, his book was not designed, the title of the book was We Will Not Be Silent. He said he was not trying to recover America, nor he was he trying to uh, emphasize, make his emphasis on uh, the, the nation itself. He said what he was concerned about, which is my concern, and I pray that it's yours as well, that the Church has been in, in, interfused with the with the world, and now the world and the church are going in the same direction, and 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 so that the church therefore does not appear to be the church that Jesus Christ died and was raised for, was raised for. Not only that, but the political situation seems to be more powerful in, in our community. To be honest, in some instances, even the church, and so. But the whole point is that the world, we know in the scripture tells us that the things, what the three things in the world is what? The lust of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the power, and then and the pride of life. Those are the three things that the enemy tempts us with. And, 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 and the, the leaders here, it's interesting, the leaders that we're looking at, the high priests and, uh, and the leaders, religious leaders, both the Pharisees, Sadducees, they had the Old Testament, the same book that Paul and Peter is preaching and teaching from. They knew the promises that God had made concerning the coming of Messiah. They were more in love with the world. And remember, I keep going back to their point. What is the point? What are they doing? They say, look, 
if we continue on and allow Jesus' name to be lifted up, he's gaining a following. And guess what? We'll lose our place in the world. That was a whole, they would rather suffer all of the promises of the Bible and ignore the Old Testament and seek the things of the world opposed to the things of God when God had given them the, the, the record. But we shall see, because I think we can learn some things from Israel. We know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it tells us they are examples that we should not lust after the things that Israel lust after. And finally, concerning the, 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 the scriptures tells us that that we are not to be to, to be desiring of the things of the world. The scripture also says that we cannot please God if we love the world. So we're going to leave it at that and we're going to continue. So if you want to know why we continue with your study. And, and, and if we are made aware that the Holy Spirit is with us, and he is able to guide and direct us into the truth, then we can listen to him even when our flesh desires to go in with the world and sight with the world and forever, for whatever reason, whatever subject, whatever challenge or whatever temptation we face, we can still be drawn back by the truth because he is the spirit of truth. But let's look at the religious leaders of this day who uh, had conflict and their conflict intensified between God's apostles and the Jewish leaders. They rose up. They rose up in this. So we're going to move right along. Last week we talked about that. When we said rose up, it was in the scriptures. To demand, or to do a manner, to behave in a certain manner, show a certain behavior or attribute, conduct or agreement with for oneself. They rose up. Now they, they had a cause, their cause. We saw the conflict. We saw the cause, the cause intensified. Uniting note, the liberal religious sect of the Sadducees with the strict religious Pharisees for political power. They, they were willing to give up all of the things of God for political power. And these are the leaders all right now. Yeah. And by the way, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They, matter of fact, they only they say that we only uh, 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 believe that the scriptures uh, 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 that we see in the Old Testament. They had the Old Testament from they had from uh, they had from Moses from from, from Genesis to Ma Malachi. They had that. They say, look, we don't believe in it or any other part of the Bible. We're gonna just go by the first five books of the Pentateuch. So they disregarded miracles and things like that. They were the intellectuals. They were. They were the educators. They were the intellectuals of the, of the Jewish uh, 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 nation. They were. And, and But they, but and on the other hand, the Pharisees, they were political. They were not political. They say they weren't. They were particularly interested in the word of God. And they were very strict. Paul tells us. He talks about his experience as a Pharisee. Pharisee knew the scriptures, they, they knew them, but the point is that they had their own bent on the scriptures. They eventually had so many commentaries, made so many commentaries about the scriptures that they, they, they raised their, their level of their own intellectual thoughts to the level of the, of, the old, of, the, of, the, of the Bible, of God's word, which clearly states in various places that we're not to add anything to the scriptures. And when they when Jesus came, they all should have been, they could have read, read the same book that Paul and the rest of them read. And they had the Holy Spirit, by the way, to convict, convict them and convince them that Jesus was the Messiah, the promise. But they ignored it for things of the world. That's all I'm saying, things of the world. And, but they, what did they do? They came together for the sake of resisting God. And, and I believe that we are in, a, in the same situation today. We can name many instances where liberals and so-called conservatives in the church body come together to resist the truth concerning the scriptures. And by the way, neither political group is, 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 has any favor with God, neither one of them. They all are in the same boat. They want power, they want prestige, and to do the things that they want to do. The Sadducees were, 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 were powerful but never gained the popularity of the Pharisees and enjoyed all those political situations required them to maintain relationships with the Pharisees. It is not surprising that they would be jealous. And I read that last week in Mark chapter 15 verse 10 and act with hostility. I say an act act with hostility toward the apostles. Well, this was a green to, a commentary on that. 
So you had conflict, you had uh, you had you had a conflict, you had a cause, and then you had the consolation, the Holy Spirit. That's what we want. That's how, that's our focus is on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit presents power to Peter and John, releasing from them from prison through an, through the through the obedience of an angel. Now listen, this 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 this, this study is not about angels. Although I'm going to share some things, I know you have a lot of some of you may have had some questions about angels. No one said anything last week. Uh, I have uh, been, been, been privileged to study a little bit about the angels over a period of time. Matter of fact, I think I taught sometimes some years ago uh, uh, in the Bible Institute on angels when I was at Arlington Baptist Church. But the point I'm trying to make is this. There's a lot about the angels in, this, in the scriptures. They were mentioned over 103 times. And, 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 and well, I'll share, share the actual uh, numbers with you. Uh, concerning the uh, uh, angels, they mentioned a lot in scripture, although we don't really talk about them or we don't know what, what, what role they play with us even today. We don't know if they are active, not active, not active, that sort of thing. Most of us don't, don't know much about the Holy about, about the angels. We have a problem admitting that the Holy Spirit or, or really recognizing or being uh, shocked, or, or being, being aware that, that the Holy Spirit is present, let alone angels. But uh, I'll share a little bit about angels perhaps at the end of our, our uh, presentation, although I'll say a few things about them then. But this is, this, this, this is t tonight is not about angels. It's about the Holy Spirit. But since the angels worked in it today, working in this stuff, in, this, in our lesson, we'll see that later on. I'll just leave it for later on at the end if we have an opportunity. Uh, somebody may have a question we can talk about. So there is a conflict, there's a cause, there's a consolation, and then there's a cost. Complete obedience to speak the name of Jesus was they were put. What was the cost? They were put in common prison. This was just a review. There, there was a care for those who completely obeyed to speak the name of Jesus. The, the, the Holy Spirit miraculously delivered them, and He delivered them through angels from prison. We'll, look, we'll pay a little bit more attention to it. It's more, it more uh, as we go along. I, I want you to see how. These men, or the apostles, there are 12 of them too, by the way. The two, Peter and John, that spoke speaking in particular in, the, in Acts, but others do as well come forth as you study the book of Acts. What I'm trying to make is that as we, go, as we look at the Holy Spirit and his work, he's do, we're doing the work and he's doing so and not bringing attention to himself. That's, the, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Excuse me. He guides the angels to re release miraculously re release uh, the apostles from the prison. Some some commentators some commentators think that, that all of the apostles were arrested. Some don't really take that position. I can only say what the scriptures say. And we'll, that we'll leave it at that. But there's a care. There, there's a commitment to those who completely obey. They are to speak the name of Jesus, the only word of life. That's the key. And him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1.4. 1, the word became flesh. John 1.15. There's courage. This is take this requires courage. Cannot be done apart from the enablement of the, of the Holy Spirit. We cannot live a life that's pleasing unto God apart from the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Cannot be done. So therefore, he is the one who is with us tonight indwelled us and we, we are saved. He is the one who gives us the guide us into the truth of the scripture. We have to study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word. That's our responsibility. And as Dr. Stanley pointed out to us, and we all know, the Holy Spirit does, he does a guiding and he does a leading, but he does not control us. And we'll see as we as we look at the apostles and how the how the uh, leadership is dealing with the apostles and what they do. But I want you to see how the apostles, remember they, they prayed over in chapter three, I believe it was, yeah, for boldness. And that's really the key. If we want to focus on one word as we as we have been studying together for this period of time, it is answered prayer. Their prayer was to be bold in witnessing for Jesus Christ. And you're going to see the fruit of their prayer. Remember the place was shaken. And, and they, they also asked that God would give them the power to perform miracles. The two things they asked for, boldness and, and the power to perform miracles. God answered their prayers, but they still had to be indwelt and led by the Holy Spirit. 
That's what I'm trying to say. Now, same Holy Spirit, the same power is available to us today. Okay, now you know, we'll look at that. That's 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 a cutaway, of course, of a of a, of a Roman Roman Empire prison. It was used mainly for holding prisoners condemned to death. The private prisons of call, Cassia Privatus, which was used to hold debtors. They had a debtors prison, prison too. Debtors prison, I think they hold you there until someone paid paid off your fine. That was, we don't have I don't have debtors, we don't have debtors prison here now today. Mm. There was a public prison called a Custodia Publica, which held people awaiting trial. No, prisons were meant to be a fate worse than death to discourage crime. Now, we have, we have had, as I can recall, and I'm not an ancient person, I've been around a while, I've been around a few years. What I'm trying to make is I remember when law and order and prisons were for to discourage our people from committing crime. But they turned it into rehabilitation. Now, I spent, uh, well, over 20 some years working in the prison system as a as from, from a personal guard all the way up to an administrator. I've held just about every position that you can have in the prison system. The point I'm trying to make is this. I have yet to know a formula that could reform or they or they call it, they'll call it a punishment. Re, re, they say go re, they go rehabilitate someone in the prison. If you if, <laughs> well, I ain't gonna get so far to this. The whole point I'm trying to make is this. The whole time I worked in the prison system. I only found three people who said they were guilty of their crimes. Everybody else was, was, was in prison, falsely accused. So that's the end of that. Now, let's go into the lesson tonight. God, the Holy Spirit, guides an angel in Acts 5, 5, 19 to miraculously release Peter and John from, the, from prison. Here we go. But when the officers came and did not find them in prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely. And God standing outside before the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. That within itself should have should have pricked the hearts of the religious leaders to know and to see that this that these apostles were endued, endued with power. And how I mean, well, I, I, there's a reason for it. Unbelief, and we'll get to this. What, what we're talking about, you, I'll mention it. The issue, the core core issue, is what we're what, what is unbelief. And the question is, can, can believers uh, uh, be, be involved or devolve or, or slide into a position of unbelief? Yes, in certain situations. Yes, yeah. yes, they can. They won't lose their salvation, but there's some instances where uh, a, a servant of the living God can be a, 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 a loyal servant, but certain issues when tempted, refuse to acknowledge the truth, refuse to respond to the truth, and find themselves and unbelief concerning a particular subject. Now you say, well, what is the answer? The answer to that is that they, the Holy Spirit will convict them and convince them, but they don't, still he will not force them or control them to accept the truth. But no one will enter into the kingdom with, with, with sinful issues unanswered. No one. Every issue that a believer has in this, in this earth, in the flesh, will be resolved. Either you and I will resolve them with one another, as, as 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 God has given us, uh, Matthew chapter sixteen verses fifteen, and on, or the Gospel of John chapter five verses twenty. I think it's twenty one and twenty two. No, twenty eight, twenty eight, twenty eight, seven, twenty eight, and twenty eight. In other words, if you have an issue, God has given us a remedy to cause our issues to be resolved here and gain a brother. The whole idea is to resolve the issues and gain a brother. The other idea is this. If you remember that a brother has an issue with you, that you don't have an issue with them, but you, you know that this person has an issue with you, it is your responsibility, as the scriptures say, leave your gift at the altar and go and reconcile with your brother. Because, again, all issues will, all sin issues will be resolved either here in the earth between, between you and I or others or everyone or at the beam of seat. Jesus will do, the, do it himself. So I'm just a warning. So these these individuals we're dealing with tonight, yeah, they they also will, will appear. Uh, some will appear to white throne judgment. They didn't even realize they was in unbelief. So they are not even in the picture because they had the word and refused to obey the word, refused to acknowledge the Messiah that God had given. In fact, they killed the Messiah, the Prince of Life. 
So they found this it was miraculous. The, the gods, you see the gods? Mm -hmm. uh, my my uh, my, uh, my my tip too. It, they was they was they was uh, standing there like this. You'll see later on. So there's God in there. There's the prisons. Yeah, there. As we go on, I'll show you another colorway. But there's nobody there. I mean, how can you explain this? But they say when they when they came when we came back and reported to them that they were they were miraculously re released. I think they didn't tell anyone. They kept it seem among themselves. They surely wasn't going to tell their people. Mm -hmm. People already knew. Of course, they saw him there, but let's see, angel. When we talk about an angel, what is an angel? He's a supernatural being created by God to serve him, often functioning as a messenger. That, that's, again, let me say a little something. Let me say a little something about uh, about these angels. And, uh, then, uh, and, and I got this information from uh, Dr. Uh, Elmer Towns from Liberty University uh, uh, Seminary. He's a, he's a, he's a uh, professor of theology at Liberty University in the School of Theology. He does a whole thing on angels. Had an opportunity to sit in his class to be, well, sit be under his class and uh and he and I have some of his notes. He says some things about angels. He says uh, there are many terms used in the Bible to describe angels, host creatures, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, sons of God, beast, and the angel of his presence. The phrase, the angel of the Lord, usually implies the presence of deity in the angelic form. He gives Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, and Genesis 22, verse 11, 31, verses 11 through 13, and on and on and on. The whole point is, but when you see the angel of the Lord, you will see a capital angel of the Lord. In this case here, it is not capitalized. It's a, so it is an angel, a messenger. He goes on to say that the, 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 the narrative goes on to indicate when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The angels were rejoicing as God created the world. So they were there. Okay, now it's a couple of things that, uh, he says about them and I'm going to uh, finish up with this. And, and this is the reason why, and I think he gives us a good purpose for studying about, about angels. He said, the doctrine of angels cannot be ignored if we are to teach the whole counsel of God. He cites Acts chapter 20, verse uh, verse 27, when Paul says that when he was there at Ephesus and he was about to leave there in Acts, he says that he did not, he did not neglect to teach the whole counsel of God. So angels, if angels are mentioned in the scripture, well, I'll at least say something about them briefly, but like I say, the angel is not the issue. He's not, the subject here is Jesus. Jesus is a subject in Jesus' church. The Holy Spirit is, is, is the one who is, is uh, invincible, invisible. He is the power behind it. He is, he, is, he, he is taking the things of Jesus and making them known to man. The angels are just messages helping, but they are mentioned. And I agree with Dr. Towns when he says, if you're going to teach the whole, whole doctrine of this, you cannot, be, you cannot ignore that the angels exist. But he says there's a number of, look there, he said there's a number of benefits that can be derived by studying the angels. First, when we realize that they are consult, constantly observe, observers of Christian, Christian lives, 1 Corinthians 4 9, and Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, we will approve, we will improve our conduct. Then, when we understand their protection of us, we will be encouraged by God's care for us, Hebrews 1 7. Then as we are consider the tremendous strength and authority of the angels, we will be encouraged. Finally, the examples of their unceasing service ought to motivate us to be more constant servant or service for God. And I think we'll see that this is a, as, as an example here in Acts chapter five that we see these things. So it's just a little something about them. I agree, if we're gonna teach the Bible we to, and they're gonna come up or say something about it. It's a lot, lot more to that. So, like I said, they're mentioned over 100 times in the, in the New Testament and, and in the, and 100 times in the, in the Old Testament. So God, the Holy Spirit, wanted us to know about it. But uh, that's not, they are not the subject here. They are just messengers obeying the Holy Spirit. The subject here is Jesus Christ and the church and the gospel. You have any questions? Of course, we can, we can, even, we can talk about them later. But let's look at uh, what God said about the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus said. God, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. That's what Jesus said. He will glorify me, or he will take off what is mine and declare it to you. 
that's what's going on here in uh, Acts chapter five, uh, uh, as we go a bit further to the study. When you, when you say it's glorified, what are you, what are you talking about? There's a Greek word there, to cause to be glorified, to cause to be positively acknowledged, recognized, or esteemed for one's character, nature, or attributes. And surely that's what the apostles are doing concerning the church. And the church is becoming more popular with the people, or, or more known, as what they use that word, because the Holy Spirit is revealing the church to the Jewish people. Paul says, that, we know he says he's not, he says not, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God into salvation, first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. So we see here in Jerusalem where the church began, the church is all Jews. And so uh, they're, they're, they're to acknowledge and recognize that their uh, they're, they're Messiah, and this is what uh, God's faithfulness is still to, toward them at this point. And they are to, and those 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 who are recognize that, that, that recognize Jesus as a Messiah, and is lifting up His name. Uh, and then they are doing what? They are recognizing, they are esteeming Him in His character and His nature, and they are glorifying Him. Jesus said He would glorify the Father on Cal on the cross, and we know that in John seventeen He says that. Well, let's look at it further. What what is it? What is what is the uh, holy? How is the Holy Spirit doing His work there and doing it so that He is invincible, invisible, but yet powerful? Well, all things that the Father has is what Jesus said. All the things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that He, talking about the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, sixteen, verse fifteen. Not the Holy Spirit glorified the name, glorified the name of Jesus by the boldness of Peter and John. Look, look what is it? Quote, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple. There we go. That's it. There it is. There. Empty. There they are still standing there. God, uh, they're gone. They are not there. Let's look at, uh, oh, what happened there? Well, let's look at Acts chapter five, verse 24. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, where they, they wondered what the outcome would be. Instead, of, wow, they, they, are, they, are, they are wondering what the outcome is going to be. They are desiring to stop the apostles from lifting up or even speaking in the name of Jesus. That's the whole idea. They're wondering what the outcome will be. We know eventually the Holy Spirit is going to give grace and he's going to raise up a man who's going to tell them some things about what they are doing is, is futile. But they, that neither, nevertheless, they can continue to do it. So, they know that, <laughs> that the prison is empty, the people are not there. And so they say, we don't know what's, what, what, what they are, they're perplexed about what, what, what can we do to uh, stop this name from being lifted up in Jerusalem, the name of Jesus. They were astonished of the jailers. Look at verse, I'll read verses 24 back to uh, Acts chapter five. I'll look at verse, look at verse uh, 23. I'll, I'll start with verse 23. And read down at 24, saying, Indeed, we found the prisoners, we found the prison, but, sh but shut securely, and the guards standing outside for the doors, outside before the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. That should have been enough as a witness, but it was not. See, miracles does not within itself cause people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. They don't. But not within themselves. It is only through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that one gets saved. You must hear it. There must be a preacher, a presentation, someone to present the Word. The Holy Spirit is the one who opened up there, as he did Lydia there when, in, in, Philippi, in Philippi, opens up the heart and calls the, and calls the mind to see the truth about their lost condition. And then he gives you that, that, that measure of faith to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. And then he translates you into the kingdom of darkness. It, it, Salvation is of the Lord, Jehovah 2.9. That's what it's all about. 
but miracles within themselves, they, they will, they, they'll know, they will get your attention, but they will not cause you to come to faith, faith in Jesus Christ. They will not. Only belief, only by faith can you come to Jesus Christ, only by faith. That's, it. that's a good point, Minister Carpenter, because sometimes you would think that the miracle would be sufficient enough to to cause you to believe. But then we got that old man called doubt that always comes around and says, you didn't just see that. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Sister Paul. Even though the prison is empty and the people are preaching, it, uh, they're back in the, at the pedicle, or protocol uh, out at the temple. Wow. <laughs> it is incredible. But again, it only it reinforces what J Jeremiah tells us about the heart. What the heart is what above all is, is desperate, is deceitful, wicked, deceitful, and desperately above wicked. All things. Mm -hmm. the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. Who can know it? Then God, but God said, "I I know it. I test the heart." And, and He said, "What well, He and, and search the mind. Yeah, search the mind and test the heart. Why?" To give to every man according to his deeds. That's both believer and non and non-believer there. Every man, every man is what? Every man in it. But they were astonished. You, you think they, they would uh, I don't know why, but they but they, they were astonished. The gates were still locked in the gods and got it, but the prisoners were gone or gone. The apostles were arrested by the Jewish leaders. The source of their hatred shown was jealousy of religious leaders. Jealousy was the jealousy of the religious leaders. That was hatred that was shown by them. Jealousy is based on the highest esteem in which Christians were held. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5. Yet none of the rest there joined them, but the people esteemed them highly. The gospel was being preached. And people were getting saved, and a crowd was getting large. The more the uh, enemy tried to suppress the speakers and threaten the leaders, threaten the apostles to stop from preaching, lifting up the name of Jesus, the bigger the church was growing. You see that the church was growing instead of because instead of or by or I don't say the church was growing, even though there were much opposition. That we're being faced, and that's and so we can expect because Jesus had told the apostles in the Gospel of John, chapter three, verse thirty, chapter sixteen, verse thirty-three. But he says, "In this world, you shall have what trials and tribulations, but take courage or be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world." He said, "You shall have." I don't know why we think well, oh, we're in America, so we think that uh, oh yes, we, we're taking it to another level where we're going to believe. And then and demand that Jesus do some things for us to name and claim it. Now, Sister Paul and others, that's, issue, that's, a, that's an interesting concept, isn't it? When the Bible clearly states to you and I that uh, Jesus says uh, in a, all through the scriptures that you cannot be my disciple. You do not take up your cross and follow me. How can you take up your cross and follow Jesus and go to church on Sunday and, and name and claim something to be rich or to be... Uh, Healthy and all this sort of thing. It just don't. Listen, we think that these are supposed to be people who are saved, who know the Lord. Leaders, leaders, Kenneth Copeland, and others who came up with this kind of a, 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 a false doctrine. But people left the mainline churches, like Genesis and other places, and went to other churches that they say, "Look, we're going out here where they say we're going. We, we want something. We want some worldly things." And I'm not. I'm gonna stop right here. I'm not because I don't want to go too far talking about the top of my head. It's not a good thing. But but, Amen, Minister Carpenter. They left us because they were never of us. They left us because they left for whatever reasons. And and I know that's a hard word to say that they were never of us. But th th that's the only. Thing. If you've left for anything lesser, any lesser word, then I I I can't understand how you would do something like that contrary to the word yeah you don't like the pastor you don't like the person preaching but it's the word of god it's the word of god so i don't i don't, I don't get it either minister carpenter yeah and then you talk to them as you see them in, in a different place where you fail the fellowship and so we down here with the so and so and so church like wow how did they get there but hey like you say <laughs> that's what john said john says in the gospel in the, in the epistles that if they were of us they would not have come right 
It would remain. That's what he said. So, but Minister Carpenter, sometimes um, those that um, go away, they actually like Sister Paula say they were never of us. They they show like they come out like they were never of us. They were never believers. Come, I've come across some that were never even believers and they left Genesis. And you would have thought that all of what we got, what we received there, it something would have penetrated or something, but they, who knows why they were there, but they weren't there to get the word because they changed totally about what they believe. Like, and it's just like astonishing to me. Like I, I really, like, I, I can't believe it. Like how in the world did that happen? Yeah. But it can happen. Amen, Sister Lisa. That's, that's why I'm with you I'm in my thought process. If you if you don't if the word don't penetrate you and get you changing, that when you hear it and, and you hear it all the time, well, I say all the time, every day when you gather together, every Sunday and and, and, and whatever, right. we gather together. That right, in different you. ministries, everything. And yeah. Then you, 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 can, you can walk it out. We, 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 you can walk it out, not just in, in, in study. We have all many, many ministries where you can serve the Lord. You can serve in any kind of capacity that God has given you a spiritual gift to serve. You can exercise your spiritual gift. I mean, what, what, well, that's another issue. Well, I guess Sister Paul had said it. Maybe Sister Lisa, maybe she's correct in the sense that maybe they weren't of us, you know, when, when yeah. we were That's right. Yeah. We can still pray that they might be saved. I mean, maybe they'll get saved in another place. But the question is, uh, the light when the light comes into you, as as we'll see, as we go further in this study, these leaders, the more light they will shine of truth was given to them, the more they rejected, the more they became harder to and harder and harder to, or harder to use that term, harder to uh, respond to the to the word. It became more uh, stiff necked as the scripture calls them in the Old Testament, they were stiff-necked. They resisted. They resist. They do resist the truth. And the more you resist the truth, we we learn in Second Thess in Second Thessalonians, the truth keeps coming to you, and you reject the truth. God said He'll allow you to believe that which is untrue. He, he calls it a lie. He'll believe a lie. And some, and some, even in the danger, Sister Lisa, the danger is, is like uh, Esau. Esau, he, uh, he, he sought, he sought it, but he could not receive it because, still, because of unbelief, he wanted the blessings of the, of, 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 of that uh, uh, Isaac had promised him. He wanted it, and he cried and sought for it, but he just wouldn't believe. He just would not believe. Wouldn't believe. Although he sought and cried for it after he found it, and then said he was going to kill his brother because his brother took the took the uh, blessing, Jacob. But he did not receive it because again it has to do with the inward part of his heart. So we have the gates that are still locked and guarded, but the prisoners are gone. Then we have the action of the apostles, the matter of faith. That's always, my brothers and sisters, a matter of faith. That's what it is, a matter of faith. The gift of God, the apostle like, to the church, we find in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, verse 6 to 16, uh, at work in the temple courtyard proclaiming Jesus. Let's, let's, let's look at that for briefly. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. You see, not only is the Holy Spirit giving, as, as, as the church of Jesus Christ is, is increasing and growing, not only is the Holy Spirit giving gifts to the church, but he's also giving spiritual gifts. And we see that in the apostles, they are gifts. Yeah, they are men, men, emphasis, men, given to the church with spiritual gifts, or give, at least a, spirit, a spiritual gift to proclaim the gospel to the, un, the unredeemed or un, to sinners. Let's use that, I'll use that term. Let's, let's, let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter four. We'll see what, what what I'm talking about, and it's the same principle that works today. And that's really what we what I was we were alluding to, uh, even as uh, we experience it today. The same principle that God is using uh, as as uh, spiritual gifts are being exercised and utilized for the body of Christ to build up the body and encourage the, the believers in the faith and strengthen their faith. Let's look at uh, Ephesians. 
Galatians. Ephesians chapter four. The topic is walk in unity. But I'm going to believe, begin reading at, I believe, uh, at uh, spiritual gifts and spiritual gifts. And then uh, uh, what it says uh, there, uh, verse seven. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of, Christ, of Christ's gift, gift or gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. All of us have spiritual gifts. These men, these apostles have spiritual gifts. Each, each person that I say, by the way, in the church in Jerusalem or any church is given spiritual gifts. What? For the body. We know that. Now, this, he ascended. What does it mean? But he, do, he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. And he himself gave, here we go, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and some teachers. These are all males given to the church. And we see a John, of which John and Peter and, other, and the other apostles were, they were gifts to the church. We see that. Why? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and, 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 and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So uh, when I read this particular verse, I say, I need to, when I'm, when I'm comparing myself, I need to compare myself to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Am I uh, uh, walking in, under the power of the Holy Spirit? And am I displaying to my brothers and sisters the kind of love that Jesus showed toward me sacrificially and by utilizing my spiritual gifts not for myself but for others and that sort of thing. So and when I when I try to evaluate my own uh, ministry and my own uh, service to the Lord, I find myself short in some areas. So therefore I cannot criticize or be a judge of others. Well I gotta get to be my, my own eye before I can judge you about your service. I'm not talking about something, other things that got, we are required to judge. But the point here is that there's a reason for God giving these great gifts. And, he, and Paul tells us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the way, the Holy Spirit wrote this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, and carried away with every wind of doctrine by the trick we are men and the cunning craftiness of deceit or plotting. And that's what we have here, cunning, deceit or plotting of men, in, in, in the book of Acts, we know that. But speak the truth in love. Yeah, that's what, that's what we should do. May, and speak, may grow up in all things unto him who is the head Christ. That, that, that's the whole purpose of the gifts. Okay. From whom the whole body join and knit together by what every joint supplies. That's all of the gifts together according to the effective workings by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And love is a key. But love is a choice, not an emotion. It's a choice. It's a choice where emotions ultimately connects to, but first it's a choice. So we have the actions of the apostles, the gifts of the apostles to the church. I just read it. And then we had the antagonistic religious leaders continuing in unbelief. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, let's go back to uh, Acts chapter 5. They are in unbelief because, again, as the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to them, he's the spirit of truth. Instead of them repenting, they begin, they resist even more. So, but there's one behind it. There's one who are blinded them by their own desires, really selfish desires. And again, 
We talked a little bit about that in the habit. The reason why I go back to a James 1.15, because this is how it all starts. In every instance where we sin, it all began as James chapter 1, verse 15 tells us. We are, we are, we, it, 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 when, when we, we, we thought, it begins with a thought process. In our mind, we think of something and we want to, we, 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 we rehearse it in our mind. We planned it, and then and then it conceived that what the thought, whatever it is, it it, 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 it it was conceived in our mind. It takes birth and grow into fruition, which is sin, and then ultimately sin leads to death or separation. If you believe us, it leads to separation from from fellowship with God. No, you don't lose your salvation. But if you are unbeliever and you are seeking. It, it, as the soil, as, as the parable of the soil, we learn through the parable of the soil. This, this, the, the word seed falls on various grounds, kinds of grounds, but uh, only only that which have received the word and then obey it, then God produces fruit and much fruit in it. And we see the fruit being produced here. But there's one behind this whole idea of, of being blinded. There's one behind the religious leaders. The, the religious leaders, God's leaders, who claim to be representing God Himself, but the, but they allow themselves because of their unbelief to be blinded, and when when and, and when 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 sin when when sin can, as I say grows up and becomes full fully grown is what James tells us. It connects to the enemy who is the essence of sin and death and resistance. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3. 3, and six, three to 6, this is how it works. And he is working really behind the scenes here, although he's not mentioned, but we know his work because Jesus, remember, you say, why do you say that? There's nothing in the scripture to say that the devil is involved in this process. We know he is. Jesus said way back when, before they crucified him, he's talking to the Pharisees in the Gospel of John chapter 8, remember? You do what your father does, and, what, and, and they consistently do what they what their uh, their father does, and that is hatred, jealousy, and murder and death. That's what they're doing. They're seeking their, they they put they thought they put, they they decided to put the, the prince of life to death, or they could maintain their worldly position. Now they want to put to death those who represent, or even they want to abolish his name. And by the way, that's happening today. Uh, do you know that it's no, pla no place in this country, I believe at this point, you can tell me what, in a public school, can you mention the name of Jesus? Anybody know something different, let me know. You cannot pray in the name of Jesus in any public school in the United States that I know of. It's prohibited. Separation of church and state. That's the kind of stuff that, uh, but there's one behind this kind of thing. Let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter four, we'll see. A familiar passage with you already there, probably while I'm talking. But we're gonna look at it with our own eyes. Second Corinthians chapter four. Verses three. But verse three says this, but even if our gospel is veiled, there it is, it is veiled to those who are perishing, and they are. What why? Whose minds, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, least the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You see that? That's, that's the whole idea that, that the, the issue that, of what they are facing these leaders are. Even though the Holy Spirit is revealing through miracles of the, the apostles, and even the apostles are using the Old Testament scriptures to preach to those Jews, they harden their hearts against, uh, against what is being said. And then they, 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 they because of their own selfish desires. And that is that uh, they cannot allow the name of Jesus to be mentioned in, in any place in Jerusalem is what they're trying to do. 
and they, they, they have succeeded in this nation in some places. That's my point. You may, you may, you may think it's different, but I can say from the, what I've read, and you may have a different experience. And I say that because once when I, and you say, here we go again, here we go with them stories. But I remember when we, we, we uh, sang something, we had a devotion and prayed and every day when I went to school. And Jesus was a, was, a, was, a, was a focus of our prayers. And I, he would, before we did anything, done anything in the classroom, we had devotion. So, and a scripture was read, we sang a song, Christian song, some of them were Christian songs, some of them were not. <laughs> Both have been. We had prayer, and then we, we began our study. You see, the, the Bible was written that the poor would hear the gospel. The purpose of the Bible, Jesus tells us that, uh, and, and, and when he speaking, when he when he uh, quoted that he was the fulfillment of Isaiah, when he came in the synagogue, he took the Bible and he read it and said, he said, "This is about me." See, before. Christ came, the gospel wasn't preached to the poor. They had no way of, 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 of knowing the written word. They couldn't speak. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't read. A, a, a large percentage of the people in Roman, the Roman government, Roman, in, the, in the Roman Empire could not speak. I'm sorry, could not read or write, nor were they free. Most, many of them were slaves. They could not read and write. Now, in this area where we are, in this age of, of uh, of a so-called progression or the age of the progressives, we can read and write and we can do all kinds of things. We can make uh, a machinery that can do all types of equipment. And they can do all, drive a truck and drive a car and do all these things. But you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, speak, speak the name of Jesus. They have taken uh, the education, the purpose of the Bible, and, and that is the purpose of the word of God was the purpose was the purpose of reading and writing was that all would come to be able to read the word for themselves like we're doing tonight. But 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 uh, the, the enemy has not gotten in and he's blind at some of our leaders. And, and many of them are quote unquote uh, some are in our, in, our, in our legislators, they are quote unquote Christians and pastors, some of our leading pastors in big, big churches, yes they are. And they also serve in the government. They they are they, they put, propagate this theory or idea of a uh, separation of state, church and state. There's no such document that ever been written in the Constitution. There's no place in the Constitution where separation of state and church and state ever been written. It's not written there. It never was there. And you can challenge me on that. Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist, by the way, he wrote something about that in, 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 in some letters, but it wasn't in the part of the Constitution. It was not. What am I saying? Well, I'm saying that the enemy has blinded the mind and many of those who, of us who claim, proclaim the name of Jesus. And then we are going down the same, we are rowing down the same river. We're all rowing on the same boat, rowing together, gaining education. When the education really begins with the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ is, is just education. So, Let's go back over to uh, Acts chapter 5. We're getting near to the end there. You say he's at this point. Acts chapter 5. And by the way, I'm not against education. I've got a few degrees myself. And I, and I, and I know that this whole education system, I will say this, is built on a, on, a, on a lie and a fault. The whole education system is crooked. Why do I say that? Because it's, it's built on a theory. Of, of devolution, a theory of devolution opposed to co creation, which we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So you can see how the devil have blinded almost a whole nation. Amen, Minister Carpenter. Look at verse 26. Back in, I'm back on the point now. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, verse 26. Then the captain went with the officers and bought them without, least they should be stoned. They still went out and went down with it <laughs> after they were told that they, they, they had miraculously uh, been uh, trans, translated from the prison into the, back at the uh, uh, temple. They, then they, the group went down to the temple 
and rounded them all up and brought them back and sent them before them. They, that, that's bold, isn't it? That, they were bold. The enemy was bold as well, but not as bold. And see, he didn't have the kind of power, didn't have the kind of power that, 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 that uh, the apostles had. And we'll see. Because there's a point here, if we can get, if we can learn something from John and, and Peter and John is this. They have learned to, they, and, and I think it's right, it's right in Acts chapter one, all the way to five, maybe all, to, all the way to five, maybe it's a six, all the way through the book of Acts, really, the five, I think Peter, and though he was the apostle to the Jews at the present time, and, and in the church, in the, in, in the infant, infant stage of the church, he is showing us that threats, whippings, cannot stop the gospel. If you are committed to uh, Jesus Christ, nothing can stop you. That's the whole point. And that's the commitment that God will have us, you and I, to have today. Let's go back. So, 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 verse 26, verse 27. And when they had bought them, they sat them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, verse 20, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. <laughs> Hallelujah. And intend to bring this man's blood on us. What did they say at the crucifixion of Christ? Let his blood be upon us and on our children. You lied about that. They say, no, we didn't say that. Tell them what the Peter, what the Peter response was. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on the tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. To do what? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit. There he is, whom God has given to those who obey him. Yes, yes. Unbelief. As we close, unbe what is unbelief? It's a trait of not trusting in and relying on someone or something, especially use of not trusting in or relying on the God of Israel and Jesus as his Messiah. When I read that, and that's a, you know that's a that's a, 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 a academic uh, definition, but it can It's a biblical. It's a biblical definition. But I, then I say, well, what is a trait? Why, why do you, what is a trait? A trait is a distinguishing part of your personal nature. Each one of us are individuals. Each one of us, are, are, are made, God has a good purpose for making each one of us. But I, I heard uh, who that said over the week, uh, said uh, over the weekend, I heard someone say that God, that we are, our souls have been wounded. No, that was not the word, damaged. God and, and Jeremiah said that the God has, has made us and wonderfully made us. And so does the psalm writer says so. David in the psalm said, We are wonderfully made. We're wonderfully made still because man, even sin, cannot alter God's plan. I, I, I praise God for that. But we are, but each one that God has made for its distinguishing purpose, given us a distinguishable personality, we call it, a personal nature. But there is some who refuse to believe, and that is part of their nature. They will not believe. We don't know who they are. They will not. But, but God say that he, tell, he gives us a reason why he made them, though. Let's close with this, and it's not in your notes. But turn with me to, to Romans chapter 9. You say, why did God do this? Well, he didn't counsel with man, that's for sure. Look at Romans chapter 9. Look at uh, verse, uh, let's see where it is. I'm going to read that so, so we keep it in context. I'll be, we'll begin at chapter, verse 19 of, of the gospel. I'm sorry, of uh, Romans chapter 9. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Or well, who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? And by the way, uh, I'll be careful with my words. Some of us 
don't like what color God has made us, or we 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 think that He has given us give us a disadvantage. Let me put it this way. But all that comes from the enemy. The enemy, and and, the, and we are bought into it because the enemy is the one who set up rules based on race. Color can go here. White can go here. White only. That's from the enemy. That never was from God. But it has convinced us that God did it, and that's why he did it. And, and maybe the reason why I say that, because many, many, I don't hear as much as I used to. Uh, once upon a time, people, the preachers preach a lot of sermon on, on, uh, on how, why we're being discriminated against because of our color. And we were, that's true. But it didn't come from God. It came from the evil one. This came from him. So we cannot say, uh, reply again, why, why did you make me this, form me this way? I'm, I thank God that he formed me exactly the way I am. I'm, I'm grateful because I'm made, I'm made in his image. It has nothing to do with my outward appearance. Nothing whatsoever. Zero, zero to do with my outward appearance. God does not deal in outward appearances. He's not a respect of person. He is with the heart. Does not the potter have power over the clay? Yes, he does. But well, formed from that same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. Yes, he does. Here we go. What if God, now here we go, this is the reason. What if God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known endure much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Or as Dr. Fowler used to emphasize in my class when I was in undergraduate school, he said it reads, uh, suffering endure with much suffering while the vessels of wrath prepare themselves for destruction. In the Greek, that's what he said. So God is going to show forth his wrath against those who have reject, rejected him and resist him, but he's going to show forth his glory to your own, and that he might make known the riches of his glory, the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared before the, beforehand for glory. He's going to get the glory out of both. You understand that? He's going to get the glory out of those who are wrath, because he's going to show forth his wrath, his real wrath. He's going to show forth his riches of his glory, the mercy on us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made us this way. Every one of us who is in the you have made us, you did not consult with us. We had no choice when we came into this world. You have placed us where you have placed us. We want to be the salt and light where you have placed us. Help us to be these witnesses that you call us to be in these last days. Our lives here in this earth is but a vapor concerning eternity. Thank you again for choosing us for such a time as this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.